So right now it's 2023, right? So I would say around 20, uh, like 2030 or the max would be 33. We will be the last generation of ownership. Like the next generation after us, like that ownership thing will be vanished. 90% or 80% of the world population will be moved to a co-sharing structure. Only 20% or 30% of the people in the world will be re like really owning, owning, right? The other people will be on, on a subscription model or a co-sharing model where they're just co-sharing the house, they're, they're just co-sharing the cars, they're co-sharing the clothes. It will be like entire economy of co-sharing. Welcome to Syndicating Your Way to Wealth. I'm Katie Cepeda. And I am Yelfri De Leon. And today we are very excited to have an extraordinary guest who's a true visionary in the realm of wealth creation and real estate. Absolutely. He is a serial entrepreneur with a remarkable track record in the real estate, healthcare, jewelry, and diamond industries. He's committed to creating a lasting legacy by generating passive income for investors through diversified strategies. He invests in multifamily, RV parks, mobile homes, self-storage, hotels, motels, Airbnb, and a lot more. He has transacted over 1,700 units and has 386 million in assets under management. Join us in giving a warm welcome to the founder of the Future Group, Dr. Vijay Patel. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the sweet introduction. I'll just uh, tell you the, you know, a little bit background about how I envision the future group, right? Um, always like to envision my future. And uh, like when I was uh, like contemplating my next venture, uh, you know, I started in healthcare and then uh, like did other stuff in between. But keeping like you know the future in mind right so we want to invest in future we want to create the future and that's why i founded the future group keeping the future in mind that we want to go after future like any properties or real estate or any real estate ideas which can accommodate the future needs right just to give you example of this year alone just the rv park sale exceeded people buying, like usually RV parks are being bought by 65 and older. So that's typical age group or the max would be 55. So that is the age group people buys the RVs. But this was the first year that people from 25 to 35 year age group bought more RVs than people from 65 or over. Wow, so that's that's interesting. So that, you know, it says a lot about the changes that are happening currently in, you know, real estate, in the economy, and all of that plays a, a major factor. You kind of got us started a little bit here. So, you know, we kind of want to know a little bit more about your upbringing and how you first got exposed to real estate and in particularly multifamily real estate syndication. Sure. So just to give you a background, uh, like I have a medical degree, but I don't practice. Uh, like most of my career has been in healthcare management. So I just uh, like I took up my first job right out of college. Uh, it was a corporate job, uh, only worked for six months. And then my, like, I don't know what he saw, but my employer saw something in me and he just pulled me out from the field and made me like, you know, to manage one of the facilities. He just bought it. So from that point, it was just a learning rodeo of fix and flipping healthcare facilities in general. So we used to buy rundown hospitals, nursing homes, community uh, hospitals, or senior livings. We go in, we fix it, we flip it, increase the occupancy, uh, like you know, fix the property, uh, fix the compliance issues, staffing issues, operation issues, and then we make it profitable and we flip it. So. I did that for almost eight years in starting off my career. Back then, I didn't know it, it's called value add. But after doing that for so long, like suddenly in 2010, I just attended one of the seminar where people like multifamily syndication uh, webinar that uh, people were raising money. And he was just going over how the value add works. And that was my light bulb moment that, okay, like, you know, whatever this guy's talking, I've been doing already. 
Yeah. I was just doing it on a hospital and nursing homes and a senior livings. Now I can use the same knowledge and same expertise and take it to the real estate. And by then I was kind of already peaking to my, uh, you know, enough of healthcare that I wanted to move on. And uh, in between my father decided to retire. So like, you know, me and my brother stepped in, I still oversee the, the jewelry business that he has that we inherited. Like he oversees the manufacturing. I oversee the sale, uh, the offices here in Dallas, but, uh, I was, that was like my side gig. I was just supervising it. But personally, I was looking for something myself that, okay, what is going to be my next venture? Something that is a long term, something that that is, you know, exciting at the same time, I can help people and, uh, you know, generate a lot of money out of it and help a lot of people to, you know, get out of the rat race and earn enough passive income, right? So, I just invested $100,000. That was my first deal uh, in multifamily. That gave me a chance to, uh, you know, uh, like get too close to the people who were All already right. doing this for 10 years, 15 years. So a lot of times I get a question of, I'm I'm just a naive and how do I start in real estate or multifamily, right? I always tell them, just invest in one of the deals. That's how you start. If anybody wants to start in real estate syndication and you don't know anything, the first thing you want to do is $20,000, $50,000, or $100,000. Just find a good operator and invest in their deals because that is the chance that they will take you with you in their journey and like open up, literally open up their books, open up the experience. Plus, you can ask more personal questions, which you will never get a chance to ask if you don't know the person or you're not in that circle. So I just used my first $100,000 investment to get a chance of picking up those brains. I started meeting up people who were operating and managing the properties. Like, what are you doing? How are you doing? What's the plan? What is the exit? Why are we doing this? Why are we not doing this? Why are we buying in Dallas, not Florida or anybody else? Why 90s properties, not 80s properties? So those things I just learned along the way that, okay, like, you know, this makes sense. Like this, these are the knowledge you need to know before you start going on the other side. So I did that like two investment as a passive investors. And then I got enough knowledge and skills. And plus I had enough connections that I was working on through my social media that I really had a good deal flow. I like one of the biggest challenge I saw around that time was getting off market deals. So I started right. placing myself in a position where I was getting almost 20 leads off market, like a good one, not just, you know, crappy, but because I wanted to add some value to my team, because one, number one, I never wanted to be boots on the ground. I'm not the property management guy. I'm not the property improvement guy. So Go the ahead. only two things left for me was either I found the deal or I raised the capital, right? Yeah. So I still have the management experience, but I still don't want to get involved myself into day-to-day -day activities. Like yeah. I just try to refrain from it. If they need my knowledge or my advice, I'm happy to, you know, give. I still I like, you know, attend quarterly meetings just to see what's happening. And if I can give my 50 cents of knowledge, of, hey, you you might want to do this, or you might want to look at the copper wiring, right? So I have saved a lot of dollars just by giving those advices, but I, I just don't want to in, get involved in day-to-day -day because uh, my time has already been taken up, meeting up investors, uh, developing new relationships, and building those connections so that we can just keep raising money for uh, you know all the deals that we have. That was a very good perspective there uh you know the fact that you mentioned that you started really you know learning about multifamily real estate syndication by investing on your first deal as a passive investor this is a very different approach than than we have heard in the past so thank you for sharing that i think that you know that that's wonderful and that's very smart a very smart strategy to you know as you mentioned get close to to the people get close to the those operators and ask them more intimate questions so that's great so even like i would say instead of paying 30,000 or 50,000 dollar to a guru mm -hmm. that is going to teach you the basic things how to underwrite 
I would say take that 30,000 or 50,000 and invest in, an in somebody deal. else's deal and get the reality of it. Because the coaching classes is just going to give you the fancy stuff. They will never tell you the ugly side of the difficult side I of agree. the multifamily syndication. So even though paying that much of money, you will never get to know the reality. But just by investing, you are not only replicating your money and earning the cash flow, but also learning the reality of multifamily syndication and learn the right way of doing, not just a fancy way of doing, because there is a difference between fancy way of doing and right way of doing, right? So I just saw like one post this morning and like, it was just like somebody just posted like, oh, if if I see an OM from a Gmail, like if 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 somebody has a Gmail on an OM, uh, I don't see those like, you know, but the reality is that shouldn't be your benchmark to judge people. I have raised millions of dollars just by you. Like I still have a Gmail. I do have my company accounts, but like company accounts, I, I don't want to like push it out for marketing purposes or general communication because it's just like flirts with the spamming and other things. So company domains, I just want to see like reserve for uh, proper communication. Like general communication, I still want to have a general platform and things like that. The number two things is the uh, uh, Facebook blue, t blue tick, right? So there's a lot of, uh, you know, fanciness going on around uh, Facebook blue tick. But a lot of people don't even know that you can literally buy that blue tick for $14. If somebody is just buying that blue tick, and trying to pretend the person he's not even B, then you don't want to like you know invest in those type of deals because you are preparing yourself to fail. Your benchmark to look should be the reality is like the you know the performance, the past performance, the knowledge, you know the expertise, the market they're going in, the properties they're going after, class B, class C, class A like, you know, the look of the property or whatever it is. Those are the real benchmark, not the other way around. Oh, somebody is just uh, has a blue tick mark, so I'm going to invest in this deal. Somebody has no blue tick mark. Uh, and the moment I found out, like I, initially I wanted to have a, that blue tick mark for myself too. But the moment I found out that you can literally buy for $14, that that is a cheap authenticity. Like, if, and anybody can buy it. And 50% of blue tick owners, they are paying that $14. They don't deserve that. It's just like paid media marketing. So don't get like, you know, blindsided by paid media marketing. Like just, just try to make an effort to know the reality and do some fact check. Wow. Uh, no, this is great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of those tips, uh, VJ. And yes, you are right. Uh, you know, usually when you pay for this mastermind groups and coaches, those are definitely some of the things that they mention. Oh, you definitely have to create a company email. Do not use Gmail. Uh, oh, you have to invest in this marketing, uh, you know, things that you mentioned. Uh, and then in addition to that, um, they make you do all of these little things that, as you mentioned, they don't really matter, right? Because in, in the face of uh, the, the real thing and reality, reality is much different. Uh, they definitely make it seem easier, but there's a lot of challenges, a lot of struggles that you have to face when you are creating a business in multifamily syndication. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I agree. And I, I really like the takeaway of if you want to learn how to get into syndications, first, if you have the ability to invest, invest in a deal that makes sense to you and learn as you go. 100%. So I'd like to go back a little bit to the beginning of the interview. You mentioned the future group. I want to know a little bit more about your company, the future group. What does the name mean to you and what does your company offer so as i said like initially like you know we like the entire company is found on a vision of keeping the future in mind so we are not investing in present like i don't want to invest in present market like i want to invest keeping future in mind maybe five year 10 year 15 years 20 years in mind so I'm looking at the trend. I'm looking at the property data. I'm looking at a lot of information to pay, like, you know, have those decisions. 
The simple thing I can tell you is in next 10 years, so right now it's 2023, right? So I would say around 20, uh, like 2030 or the max would be 33. We will be the last generation of ownership. Like the next generation after us, like that ownership thing will be vanished. 90% or 80% of the world population will be moved to a co-sharing structure. Only 20% or 30% of the people in the world will be re like really owning, owning, right? The other people will be all on a subscription model or a co-sharing model where they're just co-sharing the house, they're, they're just co-sharing the cars, they're co-sharing the clothes. It will be like entire economy of co-sharing. And that's that. where the market is going right now. And that's one of the reasons I shared is uh, the RV park, because people are not like the generation coming up. They are not ready to be tied to one asset so that they like, you know, they can't even move. If they buy a house, they're stuck. Right. So yeah. they want the freedom and flexibility to move around. Like people like the idea of working from anywhere, everywhere. That will be the next generation thing that the employer has to offer that so they can travel at the same time, work and enjoy the life balance because the industry itself is changing. Like there's a lot like, you know, the air, just look at Airbnb. Like 10 years ago, you know, the concept for air was like wasn't even there. Mm -hmm. But in 10 years, it just revolutionized the industry of co-hosting and co-sharing uh, in, in a lot of ways. So that's why we are having STR fund uh, right now. So that's why we are going after co-sharing properties and creating those memories and experiences, which like a regular thing cannot give. Just to give you a perspective of why STR. So like what we are creating is the... The sole purpose of STR fund is to create the wow properties. So we are buying like, you know, if we're buying a house for $700,000, we are putting a $700,000 in a renovation. But that will create a wow property, which will just give you a lasting effect like that you will remember for 10 years that, oh, we had a Christmas gathering at this property and that was memorable. Like it has all the golfing inside, you know, like the pool area, or you can have a pool party, you can have a corporate retreat, you can have a basketball court, you can have a tennis court, you know, all those things. Yeah. Uh, no, this is great. You have touched on a very, very, very important point. Uh, you know, we are already seeing the fact that we are living in a co-sharing of spaces, co-sharing of, you know, even cars. Uh, I personally own a co, you know, uh, it's called like a co-hosting or co-sharing of, of vehicles uh, business. Uh, essentially, you know, I own a car, I don't use it and I, somebody needs it, right? Uh, they can come in, pick it up, you know, rent it, use it for the weekend and then bring it back. And I totally agree with you that especially how the world is changing after COVID, where people are wanting to be here, but be everywhere, you know, just be having the ability to have that life by design where they can pick up a computer, work remotely from anywhere in the world and, you know, be able to rent an Airbnb, rent an apartment that's already furnished, right? Um, rent a car, not necessarily from, you know, one of these big companies, uh, that only offers a limited schedule, limited time. So we are already seeing the, those trends. So we are. Let me tell you that. another thing that will blow your mind, like a subscription model. So what we are actively uh, experimenting even right now is a subscription model. So, and that we want to apply across the board. So you can have a, like right now, so far, you know, the subscription for Netflix, you know, the mm -hmm. subscription for, you know, uh, internet, right? But what if you can subscribe for multifamily, like for apartments? So let's say I'm the, the future group owns 100 properties across US. So, and you are not bound to live at one property at any given, you just subscribe. And you can live any property for like on a monthly basis across my 100 properties that those are spread out in Las Vegas, Arizona, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, you pick a place. We'll we'll find a property for you. Sign hey, me, sign up, me for up for that. that. <laughs> Same. Sign me up for that. 
anytime. So the, th- those are the things is going to happen in future group. I love that vision. I, that's very visionary. And, you know, I, I can't wait for a world like this. One of the things that we wanted to touch on is why multifamily? Because, you, you know, as you mentioned, you have a very diversified portfolio. You invest in short-term rentals, you invest in hotels, RV parks, and all of these things. Why multifamily? So, like, in each, like I, I, I just have to go back because multifamily was my first rodeo, right? So, again, in 2010, I was, uh, before even entering to multifamily, I looked up everything. So, for close to one year, I started following all the gurus. Like, you know, almost I started following 20 gurus who were coaching and, uh, you know, putting out all the content on social media, watching it, reading it. Also started exploring like wholesaling, uh, explored like a single family rentals, uh, explored almost every niche that was available at that point. But what I really like about multifamily was the scalability of the project. So like compared, like, you know, especially with single family versus multifamily, the scalability is very, very high, right? And plus like fixing it uh, and like, Dealing with property in general, it's it's way better than compared to, let's say you have 200 houses versus 200 apartments, like the management side, is, and that's where it's a deal breaker because managing 200 houses going all over is, is, is not hard, it's almost impossible. So right. if you know Rod Cliff, so he used to have 200 houses and when 2008 happened, he literally went bankrupt just because he could not keep up with the properties fixing up and everything else. And it's he's telling it in a in, in an interview, so I'm not even telling like you know inside information. Right. But it, it is a reality. Like fixing and keeping up with the individual houses is just too much of a hassle in a logistic purposes and everything else. While in multifamily, there is a scale to it. Like you know, 200 units are similarly built with similar uh, you know, stuff like carpet, uh, cabinets, uh, appliances, uh, even faucets or toilets or even tiles. So you can scale it. And plus you, you can use the same thing. So there is your buying power is better. You can negotiate. Plus you like you are using the same thing so you can stock it. Versus single family, you cannot stock it because like, it, it's not matching. Like, you know, the tiles are not matching. The faucets are not matching in every house. So you cannot do that. But in multifamily, you can literally stock fans, lightings, everything else. You can buy it in bulk. You can keep it for reserve. And it's just so much better logistic. So for that reason, multifamily outshines anybody else for uh, on a scale purpose. I'd also like to add that it's a team sport. Basically, yeah. going to what you were saying, you're not doing everything yourself. You can hire a property management company and, you know, get the reports with how the rent is going and cu- and how the they're performance collecting. of the property. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And as an investor, you know, you don't have to be there and do the business plan and implement the business plan. You just have to believe in it and invest your money and you passively receive that. Yeah, yeah. the biggest three, they say, like, trash, uh, tenant, and toilet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I definitely, you know, don't want to be fixing toilets. Yeah, that's the horror stories, right? But like that's that that takes away a lot of people from real estate just by hearing that, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to deal with it. But when you invest in multifamily, you don't have to. So what would you say is your favorite investment strategy? Every asset class is like, you know, my favorite. It's not like, oh, I'm picking asset class. What I'm picking is my benchmark. So my benchmark is six to eight percent cash flow, twenty percent IRR, and uh, uh, two x equity multiplier. And typical cycle I'm looking for is a three year. So whatever asset class is going to fit in that criteria is my favorite asset class. That's for great. so many years it was multifamily, and I think it will be. But uh, like I go by my benchmark numbers because those are the numbers I want to deliver to my investors uh, at the minimum or better, but not less. Yeah, no, I I love that very, you know, straightforward criteria. Hey, you know, as long as I get these returns, this is my benchmark, let's go for it. 
Uh, I yeah. love the open-minded attitude about it. That's mm -hmm. great. So switching gears a little bit here, um, what trends are we currently seeing in real estate today? You know, what would you say is, you know, is the trend, where is the real estate market heading to? What, any opinions on this? So, like, it depends on the area, but in general, like, uh, w one thing I shared was a co-sharing, right? So, like, of course, like, not entire real estate will convert into it, but there will be a big size of real estate will be converted into co-sharing or subscription-based mm -hmm. model. Like, I would say around 40 to 50% of it. Like, rest of the 50% will be still uh, a regular market where, uh, you know, regular things are happening. But... Apart from that, like, you know, uh, I'm still looking like, you know, actively pursuing some creative way of doing. My problem is I'm, uh, I hate to be the commoner. Like right from my high school, like, I just don't want to do it. When everybody is doing it, I don't want to do it. So right. if I see like, okay, everybody else is doing the same thing what I'm doing, it's time for me to move on to something else because that doesn't excite me anymore. That's so it's just approach. my personal problem. But again, I, I still look for my benchmark numbers because I still have to perform at that level for me to justify to move on from uh, any any asset class to different asset class. Yeah, no, that's that's very good. And then in terms of, you know, just the, the real estate market in general, you know, how do you see, like, for example, the, the high interest rates at the moment? Uh, you know, how have they affected, for example, your benchmark for your short-term rentals or multifamily um, investments criteria? So definitely we, we, we look at the market uh, and that's why we are uh, shifting some gears because you have to fine tune accordingly. Mm -hmm. So right now at 8% uh, interest rate, like the BRR is dead, you know, right. because at 8%, it doesn't even make sense. You don't make money. So the only way you have to make money is either you buy cheap or you buy it in a market which is growing so that it can keep up. The biggest problem uh, right now uh, you know, in multifamily happening is people are performing at, at what they're committed, but what they blindsided by was insurance uh, premiums and uh, the interest rate. So those are the two things. So just a simple example, somebody bought a property at $1,100 a door and they're projecting like $1,500 or $1,700 a door, right? So there's a $400 of rent increase that they already achieved mm -hmm. like in a one year or two year period. But that is, that is being eaten by $200 from insurance and $200 from the interest right, that right. they had. So there's nothing wrong that they're like, you know, the operator is doing it, but it's just that like they were just blindsided by these points, mm -hmm. uh, which they did not consider before entering into that market or taking that bridge loan or, uh, you know, buying that property. So you just right. have to be keeping those things in mind and you underwrite your property accordingly so that uh, even if it is 50% occupancy, you should be still able to, uh, you know, meet your uh Target like returns, if you're not generating yeah. cash flow, but at least able to survive. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, no, that definitely goes back to making sure that you do your research, making sure that you stay up with the with the trends in the market, changing markets, and uh, at the same time that you do a conservative enough underwriting that even when these market conditions are the way they are that you are still able to meet your returns so and that's difficult you know it's it's not an easy task like one thing with the multifamily syndication is like the biggest uh you know uh satisfaction or whatever you want to call it is by providing the safe communities uh you know like for a very long time in dallas and everywhere multifamily assets were neglected like you know it was owned by uh, people for 20 years, 30 years, and they were just milking all the dollars from it, not giving back to the community. One really good thing I saw right after multifamily syndication started kicking in is not only like they are buying those properties, but they are flipping and making into uh, like, you know, they're also giving back. And that's what, that's how they are also receiving. 
So they are adding like a dog park, they're adding like a carport, they're adding some parks, they're adding more barbecue area, they're fixing the pool that was not being fixed for 10 years. Uh, you know, so tenant do does appreciate those things. I have literally seen a lot of makeovers here in Dallas, which the properties was neglected for like 10 plus years. Nobody was even taking care of the property. Like the roads were bad, you know, the paints were bad. It was just beige, like beige on beige. Like you, you can't even differentiate what is roof or what is wall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a big part of uh, multifamily syndication and, and just doing this business in general is improving the quality of those tenants. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not only like, okay, you know, the futures group Helios is going to come and buy this properties and just increase the rents by four or five hundred dollars, you know, profit out, out, out of it and then just sell them. It is really just improving the quality of life of those tenants mm -hmm. and improving communities and making sure that they are happy to to come home you know to call yep. that place home. exactly we're, we're looking for the problem in the building what's going on do they need a different property management you know are is the building needing any renovations and we're going in there and we're helping not only investors, but we're also helping the individuals that live in that building. Yeah. Right. So you price. have to keep one thing in mind is your rent is going up regardless. So the guy who was owning for 30 years, that is true. he's not keeping the same rent. Mm -hmm. He is rent, like increasing the rent. But now the beauty happening is like, you know, against the increase, people are getting the value. Like the cameras are installed, the safer neighborhood, gated communities, you know, some extra patrols, securities if the class C properties. So it really helps like and people are appreciating that. So shifting gears again, I know that you have a mastermind group where you help individuals learn how to raise capital for large deals. Can you tell us what are your best tips for raising capital? So. Just. Uh, fix yourself first. That's that's the biggest tips I have given so far. And I, I can still give like this will be my first word. Even if somebody's paying me, I would I would still say the first word is fix yourself first. The reason is people do not invest in deal. People invest in people. You have to understand that. That's powerful. And like. It is so much of a kind of light bulb moment. When I realize it, it just changed my life. And that's why I'm being successful in uh, in uh, raising capitals. So uh, you, you have to fix yourself. Like what I mean by that is like whatever presence you have, like a physical or social media or whatever it is, you can look up my social media presence. Like I have a very good social media presence. And the one thing really happened in last two years is more people knows me than I know them. I get daily DMs from people that I have not even talked or met, but they've been watching my content. They've been following me for years and they like me. They already like, like, like my work and they appreciate it. So you have to make that shift in your personal journey. I did it myself. So if you want to do it and if you want to be a successful capital raiser, the first thing you want to do is fixing yourself. So the these were the things I wanted to do, like, you know, like when like the beginning of career, uh, like I did not want to do mastermind. The only thing I'm doing mastermind is now I think I can do the justice to it. Like in my approach, I, I'm not a book guy. Like personally, I don't like reading. I like more practical approach. But of course, there is a there has to be some learning before you do that. So the way I structure my mastermind is you will have a 50 percent of learning, but 50 percent pure hands on where I literally hold your hand and walk you through or audit whatever system you're using, whatever things you're using. OK, what, like what is working? What is not working? Why is it not working? And literally take you behind my uh, you know, system and show you all the things like, okay, if I'm raising money, this is how I'm doing in an actual manner. Yeah, 
That's great. Um, and, you know, this is a very powerful tip here. So fix yourself. And, you know, also just to share, me personally, I met Vijay Patel uh, through social media a while back. And, you know, as you mentioned, it is because you do have a strong strong social media presence, especially on Facebook. I see you out there daily interacting with people, groups, the mastermind group, uh, you know, giving tips on capital raising. So that's great. And I do agree with this that, you know, you do have to be out there because if an operator, if somebody wants to invest in a deal, they will, the first thing that they will do is find out who the operators are. Mm -hmm. Are they on LinkedIn? Are they on social media? Can I... Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, can I can I locate them? Like, what if they the take my money? Thing, <laughs> before they even talk to you, mm -hmm. they like, they will look up Helios on internet. Right. They, before even you get a chance to talk to you. So that's why it is so, so, like, important and powerful is fix your social media. So, like, remove all the political stuff, remove all the offensive stuff like which you don't even realize, but you have thrown off just like a lot of people just by that, that did not, they did not even uh, like, you know, schedule a phone call with you. They mm -hmm. just pass by. Totally, totally agree with you on this. So it like, it, it is just so powerful. So like, you know, there are stages to it. And like, those are the things uh, I, I'm trying to add value to my students or anybody who's trying to learn capital raising. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So staying on that topic, uh, VJ. so, you know, you, you mentioned, okay, so this is the first step to raise capital. Uh, you got to fix your social media presence. You got to fix yourself, work on that. Don't be afraid to be seen. And don't be afraid to be seen, yeah, right? Yeah. But um, so are there any processes and systems that you use? So, you know, once you've done, you've taken th those actions, you've fix yourself, you invested in your social media, you're actively and, uh, you know, in those social media platforms, but now you're connecting with a lot of people, you're generating leads. What do you do next? Are there any processes and systems that you personally use that have? So there are three mm -hmm. principles that I personally follow. First is get to know you, right? So the first phase is get to know you. Like, if I friend, like send a friend request or if I send a connection request in LinkedIn and the person accepts, like let's say you just accepted, you saw my profile, you just saw my picture, you saw my name. So mm -hmm. that is a get to know you face is before that I did not even existed in your life. But now since you accepted my connection, you saw my name, you saw my picture. I just literally existed in your life. Right. Right. So it's a journey that you have to go through. The number two phase is making them like you, right? So the way you do it is share your knowledge, share your expertise. Like you don't have to be pro at everything, but just share what you know. Mm -hmm. I agree. And then people will start liking you. Right. And you know what? This first step reminds me of a very widely known banking term kyc know your customer first right <laughs> yes 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 it is so so much important mm -hmm. so like you know get to know you first then make them like you and number three is make them fan of you these these are the three steps i personally follow and of course there is more detail to it which right. will take hours of even like i i literally recorded 10 hours of just pure webinar based on these things how do you master each level of expertise like how how to you know master get to know you level how to master get to you know like you level and then th like the final step is once they are your fan it doesn't matter what you have they're investing in you they're not investing in real estate so that's great i have get to that point that if i'm sh like switching my gear it doesn't matter if i, I prepare them for a uh, multi-family and it's just happened like i just raised like I, I had a soft commitment of $500,000 for STR fund, but I just went to them and like, we are closing our RV park this month and we were just short 400,000. So I just went back to them saying, hey, I know you did a soft commitment for short, like short term, but this is something we are just closing this month. And these are the numbers. This is the property. What do you want to do? And like, you know, 400,000, they just invested in RV park and said, okay, like, you know, well, we'll continue working with SDR, but let's just invest in RV Park right now. Is there a specific challenge that you have gone through 
and how were you able to overcome it? I know this is something that a lot of listeners would like to know. So the first thing I can tell you is you are talking to the most introvert person you can ever see or no hear. way i cannot believe you vj yes <laughs> and that is the truth like i was so so much afraid of public speaking i still like still today i i have my goosebumps but like i'm just getting over it but i'm the person kind of minding my own business person i don't talk too much uh like apart from my professional life so now i have kind of a switch that i develop over the period of time in my professional life, I'm very, very active. I'm on a driver's seat. I'm taking lead. I'm taking charge. I'm talking to people. I'm taking phone call, talking nonstop, talking almost hours. I can do that. But the moment I switch off, I go back to my quiet life because that's who I am. And I'm not going to change that. I'm, I'm very personally very quiet person. I like quiet life. I don't like too much of a busy life. So if, if it is a weekend, I just want to enjoy, relax. Uh, sp spend some time with my family. I have a two-year-old daughter. So, you know, just, just play with her, take her to the park and just do some simple stuff. Like, you know, we go for a walk, me, my wife, my daughter. So I, I enjoy those things. I, I don't have to go to the fancy place or fancy restaurant. We, like, you know, I'm very down to earth person. Money is not something like, uh, you know, uh, it's good, but it's not something that like, oh, I have extravagant life. I have a very simple life. Right. That's great. Thanks for sharing. It's like um, Steve Jobs mentioned, uh, you know, when he, when he was lying in bed, wealth is something you just get accustomed to. And, you know, the rest is just life is simple. So you got to. Yeah. You don't want to do complicate you with, with, with showing off and, you know, trying to be somebody that you don't even know, like, you know, like you are not that person. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're trying to keep up with that, like, you know, you, you're just preparing yourself to fail. Right. So uh, like, you know, going back to your question, like, you know, like you have to like, it, it's just a demand of the situation. So you cannot say no. If you want to prepare yourself for success, you have to like, you know, um, build certain approaches in you, right? So certain things like, you know, see, learning is important. How do you get it? Doesn't matter. So somebody really likes to read the book. Somebody likes to listen to the books. Somebody like, you know, just gets the practical knowledge, but learning is important. So that is a baseline. How do you get it? It's up to you. You just analyze, okay, what do you like? Like, do you like reading? Then read the books, listen to the books or attend seminars or talk to the person or get a mentor, whatever it is. But learning and change your person, like, you know, personal life uh, and overcome the challenges. Like even morning, like morning routine, right? Uh, for a very long time, I was not a morning person. Like I still like, uh, the way I kind of found a middle ground was, I, I still like to sleep like eight hours. The least I can handle is a seven hours. Under six is not something for me. I have a cousin who, who sleeps like less than six hours. Wow. Like, and he's totally fine. But for me, for personally, I know that I need seven to eight hours of sleep. So I go, I just go to bed early and then wake up early. Right. So as long as that happens, I'm, I'm totally fine. I don't have to struggle. Like um, my sleep is good. My morning is good. I, I go to gym, uh, you know, work out a couple of days in a week. So it, it just overall balance it. But if I try to be up at night and then also try to wake up, then my life will be miserable. So you have to give and take depending upon situation where you want to go. Like, do you really want to like get up in the morning and get some stuff done? Because I really like that. Like the, the early morning hours that you get, mm -hmm. the productivity is, is, is very high. Right. Like, you know, very, very high. So just to get that, I started giving up the late nights. I like to watch movies late night, but, you know, I started like, you know, reducing on that or I just try to plan it accordingly that I can watch it early before my bedtime. Right. No, that's great. And, you know, a lot of the things that you're mentioning are things that big leaders in the world uh, share with you, you know, uh, morning routines, working out, making sure that you take care of your health, that you get enough sleep, that you have routines, that you uh, 
um, organize your day and uh, you know, do accomplish the things that you need to do. So that's great. Really quickly, and one mm -hmm. takeaway that I can take from what you said is just the fact that if you have a challenge, just face it. You know, you don't like waking up in the morning. What can you do instead of saying, okay, this is a challenge for me? No, let me go to bed earlier and that way I could wake up earlier. Or going back to the public, I think you mentioned the public speaking and you being an introvert. So both can coexist. You could be an introvert and be reserved, but when the time comes that, yeah, I, I don't like to do this, but if this is gonna get me to where I wanna be, I'm gonna face it. Right. I love that. Yep. Um, so I know we're coming to an end of our interview here. So, you know, before we we wrap up, I just want to ask you, VJ, is there anything that you're currently doing with your company, with your group that you would like to share with the audience? And if so, how can our audience, how can the listeners get in contact with you? Sure. So like the first thing to go is the futuregp.com. That's my website, all the updates uh, that is already there and will be there. We uh, you know, update very frequently. We do have a blog post that we do uh, like give out like I think twice a week. Uh, but uh, that is something that keeps you up with what we are doing and get, get you a little bit of insight of uh, before it goes to public like you know the subscription model right so those are the things we we send out in our blog post or blog emails that we send out just to give people heads up that okay like you know this is something we are working on if you're if you're excited or if you want to be part of it then yeah definitely you know we want to talk about it and get some feedback about it so there's always like a front end back end project but the futuregp.com is my website and like i think that is the first step to go uh, apart from that you can always connect with me on social media linkedin and facebook and i'll be happy to you know um, talk to you and see like hear about you and uh, you know what you have to offer and like you know happy to exchange some ideas 